heading into work again, taking my bike. It solves a few problems. Well, number one, I want to keep miles off my truck. It's up there around 80,000 miles. And the other is fuel economy. My truck's not that bad. It averages around like 18 miles a gallon. Or at least the way I drive it, it does. It's a Ford F-150. It's got a 5.0 Coyote in it. And, oh, it's fun. Anything that'll light the tires up anytime you want it to is fun. I'm trying to take care of it. I'm starting to get at that age where I don't think I'm going to have many more vehicles left. When I was in my 20s, I went through a lot of vehicles. I know a lot of this did, especially from my time warp. If you were born in the 70s, you probably went through a lot of cars in your 20s. You know, we're not talking nice cars either. Car, some of them are worth money today. They really weren't worth money then because they were just some piece of crap. You know, even bikes. You know, I had a 74 Kawasaki, three cylinder, two stroke, 750. I wish I still had, I had two. One was a parts bike, you know, because it was a, his and hers thing a husband and wife had. Sorry about my phone updating there. I don't know what the hell it's doing. It's going to beep, beep, whatever. Beep, beep. But to get them working, because they sat out in the field for a long time, I had to um, use one for parts. But I still had two of them. I had a 72 Volkswagen Super Beetle that I bought had. Roller bearing crank, dual Delornas. Had a snorkel, all kinds of stuff. And you know, I had an 81 GMC that was tubbed out, dropped, and I had a full house 454 at it, two four barrel Hollies. But these were all pieces of shit that you put your time and money into. Nobody could afford to buy a new car or anything like that. Not then. Not unless you had parents that would co-sign and most of us were too poor to have parents that had things like credit. So <laughs> we just found some old clunker and you know your paycheck kind of went towards it. Like do I eat or do I buy a part for my truck? You know? That's just how it was. But it's one of them things. My my wife is having her 50th birthday on Saturday. You know, I'm not that far behind her. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I got four years. I'll hit the same thing. I don't go through vehicles like I used to. It's not really what I do. I get something nice and I keep it for a long time. It's like I had a 93 Chevy pickup. And I had that pickup for nearly 20 years. And, you know, I'll probably have another bike um, I don't know what kind it would be or anything like that. I like the Rogue Glide the best of the actual motorcycles. I kind of like that Rogue Glide trike. That might be my next one, <laughs> depending on how long it is, you know? Who knows? I may have five or six. I may not have any. I might not make it to work. That's just the risk you take on a motorcycle. It's a risk you take on your, in your car, too. Just a little bit easier to die on a bike. Nothing really protecting you. I had a cousin die test riding a motorcycle. A test ride. 
18 years old and this is someone who could actually ride a bike you know we all grew up four-wheelers and three-wheelers and everything else and, you know it was really three-wheelers and then four-wheelers because well three-wheelers apparently people getting hurt on them got unpopular we had dirt bikes and all that kind of stuff I have a lot of family members that ride motorcycles yeah he could ride but he lost control I don't know why I don't know if anything cut him off I don't know what the deal was he's 18 and he wasn't wearing a helmet and he hit his head on the curb and he died Technically, he wasn't like a first cousin, he was like my like cousin's cousin, but we all kind of grew up around each other, you know, one of those sort of things. Think about him every once in a while. But anyways, I don't know how many more vehicles I'm going to have. I'd kind of like to have my pickup paid off and start putting that money into retirement. And if I got another bike, something's getting traded in. I don't know. might end up with more. I'd like to have a dirt bike or a good dual sport, something like that. I don't have the funds right now. Something had to get paid off and refinanced. Unless I can just find a good deal of cash. But I don't see me having that many more vehicles. We kind of want to get another house, a bigger house. We've had ours for over 20 years. It's technically what would be called a starter home. You know, it's a three bedroom house, a little tiny three bedroom house at a subdivision out in the swamp. It'd be nice to have a larger one. I don't know if it will. Realistically, I've got what, 20 years left on this earth tops. Somewhere between one second and probably 20 years. Weird to think of it that way. I've probably got somewhere between one second and 20 years left on this earth. You know, um, I could live longer. My great great grandmother was 107. Her daughter lived to be up in her 90s. My grandmother died at 62. Actually, both of my grandmothers died in their early 60s. So it's like, if that's the goal, I've got less than 20 years and I'll be older than them. We're talking like, yeah, I was hitting close to 15-ish. 12, yeah, had 16 years. I know what their health was like. Well, I know what the one's health was like, really. I took care of her. She was on hospice. Until the hospice nurses killed her. Which they do quite frequently and at the request of the family. You know, everybody debates euthanasia and all that, but we do it all the time. You know, her brain had been deprived of oxygen for too long. And they're like, if she comes back, she won't be the same person. She's not 
you know, basically grandma you knew was gone. <clears throat> and they overdosed her on morphine. Put the morphine under her tongue and everybody said their goodbyes. As is the normal practice here in the United States, you know. We campaign against things like that and it's wrong and the church says it's wrong but when they're on hospice and you know they kind of give you that choice or you know I had a friend that they gave her a big bottle of pills and you know they told her what would happen if she took all of them and gave her a wink because at a certain point it gets to be too much we're all only human and the stuff of expecting somebody to live in that kind of pain and just keep suffering is the most selfish thing I've ever, you know, witnessed. People are like, suicide's selfish. It, usually it's not a selfish act. It's usually an act of desperation and they usually don't think you give a fuck. You know, if it's not an act of, like, you know, your health kind of thing. <clears throat> and used to, which is kind of the other end of it, you know. A lot of things kind of come back to tea. All these laws that we think are going to stop something. Laws don't stop shit. You know. I'm not pro-abortion or anything like that, but, you know, the Bible tells you exactly how to perform one. Of course, the difference is, if it's successful, God says you're a whore, so you're supposed to be executed. But those herbs are, I believe, about 70% effective, <laughs> and we've got better herbs available now. So, are you really stopping it? No, you're not. I don't agree with it, but it's not going to stop. Or, you know, Grandma, it was time for her to go. And she sat around with her daughter and her granddaughters and all of them and she drank a little bit of tea and she drifted off into sleep. And that was just the way it was done for thousands of years. You know, people may not talk about it like that now. There are some cases where people went through extreme agony and that's supposed to be the norm, you know? Like you're going to hell if you don't suffer suffer here on earth but at a certain point it's just cruel and it's just a selfish act of the people who that you're leaving behind because they want one more day of you know to be with you and it doesn't matter how much pain you're in you know because they don't want the pain of losing you if that makes any sense so grandma drank a little tea to check out her daughter drank a little tea so she could feed her daughter uh, get that milk production up and her daughter had a problem you know the granddaughter and she drank a little tea and she didn't have that problem no more that's why they went after the witches and those sort of people that you know knew all of those things you know the witches had that was somebody who made mead that's how you knew when you went to town who had the honey beer you know but you know these were the healthcare providers and stuff like that they weren't witches like we think of today that sort of thing these were just well actually um <laughs> They went after any women that were helping health care. The church was supposed to take care of that, I guess. Same church that tried to kill one of my great aunts. Said, you're not right with God. That's why God is punishing you. These doctors can't save you. Don't go to the doctors. And, well, 
That was Joel Olstein's father that nearly killed her. Somebody finally talked some sense to her and got her back with the doctors. And the doctors, well, they saved her. But there's a God, he puts people on earth that can help you. Not that they're perfect either. More people die from legally prescribed drugs than all narcotic, illegal narcotics combined. You know, but what do you gotta do? What are you gonna do? Most anything you think you're gonna stop, you're not gonna stop. You think you're gonna disarm the whole population, it's not gonna happen. Criminals will still have guns. The gun crime will still be there. They won't report on it the same, you know? Because they're all after your Second Amendment rights. And they wanna conflate a whole bunch of things and act like, oh, these are mass shooters. It's gang violence. The same gang violence that was going on in the 90s all through the assault weapons van and all that crap you know they want to act like this image of it's just white people and they promote it if you look it's a white guy his pictures out there it's everything's out whatever manifesto whatever and if you don't see that instantly okay it's part of some protected group or something like maybe one of my people did something <laughs> you know we still haven't got the Nashville Shooters Manifesto, but if you look at it, I mean, it wasn't like the Virginia Tech shooter, I think Asian, it was that Asian lady a year or two ago shot up her office in California, the Dallas shooter was a black guy, um, we've had every race has been involved, and if you're Caucasian but not white, by that, I mean if you're Northern African, which they're Caucasian, if you're Middle Eastern, which are Caucasian, scientifically, you know, races like that, but not considered white, you're only not white to the media's benefit. Like that guy that shot up a grocery store, you know, they're putting them out there, when was that, what, two, three years ago in Colorado? They put him out there as like, oh, he's some white guy. And then they find out he's like a Syrian Muslim. And then like, oh, oh, and they backed off of all that because it wasn't promoting their narrative. The media, if you're ever involved in anything where the media is involved and they're reporting on a case, you know what's going on. You know the people, you know what happened and you see how the media slanders them. You know, and just outright makes up lies and bullshit. You'll find out, you know. If you're old enough to remember how things used to be and how even left-wing media wasn't good to people like me, you know. Even back in the 90s, the left still had a lot of the religious stuff in there. I kind of think they need it back, <laughs> you know, but, you know, the whole gay marriage debate and everything, uh, they weren't exactly our friends. So, wasn't that long ago you could get arrested for wearing front fly jeans. Not that they'd do that in small town America. The cops were used as a private army to enforce, you know, unjust laws. Kind of like what's happening today. You know, people act like that's a new thing. No, that's one thing that I guess uh, I agree with certain sides on is there's a lot of white people that think 
oh, the cops just now got like this. No, they didn't. Cops have always been like this. Cops have always been the private army of the state. That's what they are. They're tax collectors, and they enforce the unjust. And every once in a while, you need them. It's unfortunately, this world would be chaos without them. There needs to be some kind of order. But they were still raiding some of our bars and stuff like that 20 years ago. And of course, they come out, oh, it's drugs or what have every fucking bar you go into, straight, gay, whatever, it don't matter, it's all got drugs in it. That's just their excuse. To come in there, throw everybody in the floor on handcuffs. It's not like you're doing drugs or anything. You're just there having a drink, trying to meet somebody. You get thrown on the floor in handcuffs and drug out and put in the paddy wagon just like everybody else. They would arrest people of like, you know, trans community, which actually goes back to the thing about, you know, front fly jeans because, you know, that was considered cross-dressing. But you have like some male to female they didn't have enough articles of male clothing on, you know? That's why you used to see they're wearing a dress, but they got men's socks and men's underwear on kind of thing, you know? And the cops, they were doing that even 20 years ago. In places we consider liberal as hell, like Houston, Texas, and Austin, Texas, and, you know? The media is not your friend. And you see what even the left-wing media does to your friends because they don't like them. I've had a few friends involved in the gay community that made the media spotlight, unfortunately. And you see how they're slandered and anything salacious they could bring out. They harp on that because people are just sick fucks, you know? and they embellish, they'll take a little bit of truth and they'll just embellish the hell out of it and drag it out, make it look like something it's not. You know? Oh yeah, we, we have a certain politician in Texas up for impeachment that has done a few things um, to some people that I know that I hope he gets impeached. I don't think he'll get jail time, but I hope he gets jail time. I don't think they can do that, but for the impeachment, what he's going through, but if that's a possibility, yeah, fry his ass. Well, that's not a possibility. They're not going to bring back old Sparky. We haven't used him in years. But just the corruption of all of it. The left doesn't like you. The right doesn't like you. They're like, you got to vote Republican to save your gun rights. You gotta vote for the Republican Party, the party that passed most of the anti-gun legislation in this country, at least on a federal level, and most of which was co-written by the NRA. Right, and these people are um, protecting our gun rights. That's right, they're protecting our gun rights. The ones taking our guns away and we just smile just like we do with the cops. And we say, you're just doing your job as you execute me at 2 a.m. because my sister-in-law doesn't like me and has a very constitutionally illegal red flag order put on you and the cops come knock on your door and well you answered the door with a gun because it's two o'clock in the morning or your door just got kicked in wondering what the hell is going on yeah life sucks that way sometimes anyways i got off my soapbox i gotta go get a few drinks to take to work and head out to the landfill. I'm running a roll off today. So I will catch you fine folks later. And bye.